Book Two, Chapter Eleven of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Eleven The Waking of the Wanderer. Now, Ray the Priest as had been appointed, went to the pylon gate of the temple of Hathor. A while he stood looking for the wanderer, but though the hour had come, the wanderer came not. Then the priest went to the pylon and stood in the shadow of the gate. As he stood there, a wicket in the gate opened, and there passed out a veiled figure of a woman upon whose breast burned a red jewel, that shone in the night like a star the woman waited a while looking down the moonlit road between the black rows of sphinxes but the road lay white and empty and she turned and hid herself in the shadow of the pylon where ray could see nothing of her except the red star that gleamed upon her breast now came a great fear upon the old man for he knew that he looked upon the strange and deadly hathor perchance he too would perish like the rest who had looked on her to their ruin he thought of flight but he did not dare to fly then he too stared down the road seeking for the wanderer but no shadow crossed the moonlight thus things went for a while and still the hathor stood silently in the shadow and still the blood-red star shone upon her breast and so it came to pass that the world's desire must wait at the tryst like some forsaken village maid. While Ray the priest crouched thus against the pylon wall, praying for the coming of him who came not, suddenly a voice spoke to him in tones sweeter than a lute. "'Who art thou that hidest in the shadow?' said the voice. He knew that it was the Hathor who spoke, and so afraid was he that he could not answer. Then the voice spoke again. O oh, thou most crafty of men, why doth it please thee to come hither to seek me in the guise of an aged priest? Once, Odysseus, I saw thee in beggar's weeds, and knew thee in the midst of thy foes. Shall I not know thee again in peace beneath thy folded garb and thy robes of white? Ray heard, and knew that he could hide himself no longer. Therefore he came forward, trembling, and knelt before her, saying, O mighty queen, I am not that man whom thou didst name, nor am I hid in any wrappings of disguise. Nay, I do avow myself to be named Ray, the chief architect of Pharaoh, the commander of the legion of Amen the chief of the treasury of Amen, and a man of repute in this land of Kem. Now if indeed thou art the goddess of this temple, as I judge by that red jewel which burns upon thy breast, I pray thee be merciful to thy servant, and smite me not in thy wrath. For not by my own will am I here, but by the command of that hero whom thou hast named, and for whose coming I await. Be merciful, therefore, and hold thy hand. Fear not, thou Ray, said the sweet voice. Little am I minded to harm thee or any man, for though many men have gone down in the path of darkness because of me, whom am a doom to men, not by my will hast it been, but by the will of the immortal gods, who use me to their ends. Rise, thou Ray, and tell me why thou art come hither, and where is he whom I have named? Then Ray rose, and looking up saw the light of Helen's eyes shining on him through her veil. But there was no anger in them. They shone mildly as stars in an evening sky, and his heart was comforted. "'I know not where the wanderer is, O thou immortal,' he said. "'This I only know, that he bade me meet him here at one hour before midnight, and so I came.' perchance he too will come anon said the sweet voice but why did he whom thou namest the wanderer bid thee meet him here for this reason o hathor he told me that this night he should be wed to thee and was minded thereafter to fly from chem with thee therefore he bade me come who am a friend to him to talk with thee 
and him as to how thy flight should go, and yet he comes not. Now as Ray spake, he turned his face upward, and the golden Helen looked upon it. Hearken, Ray, she said, but yesterday, after I had stood upon the pylon tower as the gods decreed, and sang to those who were ripe to die, I went to my shrine and wove my web while the doomed men fell beneath the swords of them who were set to guard my beauty, but who now are gone. And as I wove, one passed the ghosts and rent the web and stood before me. It was he whom I await tonight. And after a while I knew him for Odysseus of Ithaca, Laertes' son. But as I looked on him and spake with him, behold, I saw a spirit watching us, though he might not see it, a spirit whose face I knew not, for no such man have I known in my life days. Know then, Ray, that the face of the spirit was thy face, and its robes thy robes. Then once more Ray trembled in his fear. Now, Ray, I bid thee tell me, and speak the truth, lest evil come on thee, not at my hands indeed, for I would harm none, but at the hands of those immortals who are akin to me. What did thy spirit yonder in my sacred shrine? How didst thou dare to enter and look upon my beauty and hearken to my words? O great queen, said Ray, I will tell thee the truth, and I pray thee let not the wrath of the gods fall upon me. Not of my own will did my spirit enter into thy holy place, nor do I know aught of what I saw therein, seeing that no memory of it remains in me. Nay, it was sent of her whom I serve, who is the mistress of all magic, and to her it made report, but what it said I know not. And whom dost thou serve, Ray? And why did she send thy spirit forth to spy on me? I serve Miriam and the queen, and she sent my spirit forth to learn what befell the wanderer when he went up against the ghosts. And yet he said naught to me of this Miriamon. Say, Ray, is she fair? Of all women who live upon the earth, she is the very fairest. Of all, sayest thou, Ray? Look now, and say if Miriamon, whom thou dost serve, is fairer than Argive Helen, whom thou dost name the Hathor and she lifted her veil so that he saw the face that was beneath. Now when he heard that name and looked upon the glory of her who is beauty's self, Ray shrank back till he went nigh to falling on the earth. Nay, he said, covering his eyes with his hand, Nay, thou art fairer than she. Then tell me, she said, letting fall her veil again, and for thine own sake tell me true, why would Miriamon the queen, whom thou servest, know the fate of him who came up against the ghosts? Wouldst thou know, daughter of Amen, answered Ray? Then I will tell thee, for through thee alone she whom I serve and love can be saved from shame. Miriamon doth also love the man whom thou wouldst wed. Now when the golden Helen heard these words, she pressed her hand against her bosom. So I feared, she said. Even so, she loves him, and he comes not. Ah, if it be so, now, Ray, I am tempted to pay this queen of thine in her own craft, and send thy spirit forth to spy on her. Nay, that I will not do, for never shall Helen work by shameful guile or magic. Nay, but we will hence, Ray, we will go to the palace where my rival dwells, there to learn the truth. Fear not, I will bring no ill on thee, nor on her whom thou servest. Lead me to the palace, Ray, lead me swiftly. Now the wanderer slept in the arms of Miriamon, who wore the shape of Argive Helen. His golden harness was piled by the golden bed, and by the bed stood the black bow of Eurytus, the night drew on towards the dawning. Then of a sudden the bow awoke and sang, and thus it sang. Wake, wake, though the arms of thy love are about thee, yet dearer by far than her kiss is the sound of the fight. 
and more sweet than her voice is the cry of the trumpet and goodlier far than her arms is the battle's delight and what eyes are so bright as the sheen of the bronze when the sword is aloft what breast is so fair as the shield or what garland of roses is dear as the helm and what sleep is so soft as the sleep of slain men on the field lo the snake that was twined about the form of her who wore the shape of helen heard the magic song it awoke it arose it twisted itself about the body of the wanderer and the body of her who wore the shape of helen knitting them together in the bond of sin it grew and lifting its woman's head on high it sang in answer and thus it sang of doom sleep be at rest for an hour as in death men believe they shall rest but they awake and thou too shalt awake in the dark of the grave do they stir but about them on arms and on breast are the toils in the coils of the snake by the tree where the first lovers lay did i watch as i watch where he lies love laid on the bosom of lust then the great bow answered the snake and it sang of the tree where the first lover's sin was i shapen i bid thee arise thou slayer that soon shall be dust and the snake sang reply be thou silent my daughter of death be thou silent nor wake him from sleep with the song and the sound of thy breath the bow heard the song of the snake the death heard the song of the sin and again its thin music thrilled upon the air for thus it sang be thou silent my mother of sin for this watch it is given me to keep or the sleep of the dealer of death then the snake sang hush hush thou art young and thou camest to birth when the making was done of the world i am older therein and the bow answered but without me thy strength were as weakness the prize of thy strength were unwon i am death and thy daughter o sin now the song of the snake and the song of the bow sunk through the depths of sleep till they reached the wanderer's ears he sighed he stretched out his mighty arms he opened his eyes and lo they looked upon the eyes that bent above him eyes of flame that lit the face of a woman the face of miriamun that wavered on a serpent's neck and suddenly was gone he cried aloud with fear and sprang from the couch the faint light of the dawning crept through the casements and fell upon the bed the faint light of the dawning fell upon the golden bed of pharaoh's queen it gleamed upon the golden armor that was piled by the bed and on the polished surface of the great black bow it shone upon the face of her who lay in the bed then he remembered surely he had slept with the golden helen who was his bride and surely he had dreamed an evil dream a dream of a snake that wore the face of pharaoh's queen yea there lay the golden helen one at last the golden helen now made a wife to him now he mocked his own fears and now he bent to wake her with a kiss faintly the newborn light crept and gathered on her face ah how beautiful she was in sleep nay what was this whose face was this beneath his own not so had helen looked in the shrine of her temple when he tore the web not so had helen seemed yonder in the pillared hall when she stood in the moonlight space not so had she seemed when he swore a great oath to love her and her alone whose beauty was it then that now he saw by the immortal gods it was the beauty of miriamun it was the glory of the pharaoh's queen he stared upon her lovely sleeping face while terror shook his soul how could this be what then had he done then light broke upon him he looked around the chamber there on the walls were the graven images of the gods of chem there above the bed the names of menephtah and miriamun were written side by side in the sacred signs of chem 
not with the golden helen had he slept but with the wife of pharaoh to her he had sworn the oath and she had worn the helen's shape and now the spell was broken he stood amazed and as he stood again the great bow thrilled warning him of death to come then his strength came back to him and he seized his armor and gritted about him piece by piece till he lifted the golden helm it slipped from his hand with a crash it fell upon the marble floor with a crash it fell and she who slept in the bed awoke with a cry and sprang from the bed her dark hair streaming down her night-gear held to her by the golden snake with gemmy eyes that she must ever wear but he caught his sword in his hand and threw down the ivory sheath end of chapter eleven book three chapter one of the world's desire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by annie hill the world's desire by h rider haggard chapter one the vengeance of kuri the wanderer and pharaoh's queen stood face to face in the twilight of the chamber they stood in silence while bitter anger and burning shame poured into his heart and shone from his eyes but the face of Miriamun was cold as the dead, and on it was a smile such as the carven sphinxes wear. Only her breast heaved tumultuously, as though in triumph, and her limbs quivered like a shaken reed. At length she spoke. Why lookest thou so strangely on me, my lord and love? And why hast thou girded thy harness on thy back? Scarcely doth glorious Ra creep from the breast of note, and wouldst thou leave thy bridal bed odysseus still he spoke no word but looked on her with burning eyes then she stretched out her arms and came towards him lover-like and now he found his tongue again get thee from me he said in a voice low and terrible to hear get thee from me dare not to touch me thou who art a harlot and a witch lest i forget my manhood and strike thee dead before me that thou canst not do odysseus she answered soft for whatever else i be i am thy wife and thou art bound to me for ever what was the oath which thou didst swear not five short hours ago i swore an oath indeed but not to thee miriamun i swore an oath to argive helen whom i love and i wake to find thee sleeping at my side thee whom i hate nay she said to me thou didst swear the oath odysseus for thou of men the most guileful hast at length been overmastered in guile to me woman or immortal thou didst swear for now and for ever for here and hereafter in whatever shape thou goest on the earth by whatever name thou art known among men oh be not wroth my lord but hearken what matters the shape in which thou seest me at least am i not fair and what is beauty but a casket that hides the gem within tis my love which thou hast won my love that is immortal and not the flesh that perishes for i have loved thee ay and thou hast loved me from of old and in other lives than this and i tell thee that we shall love again and yet again when thou art no more odysseus of ithaca and when i am no more miriamun a queen of chem but while we walk in other forms upon the world and are named by other names i am thy doom thou wanderer and wherever thou dost wander through the fields of life and death i shall be at thy side for i am she of whom thou art and thou art he of whom i am and though the gods have severed us 
yet must we float together down the river of our lives till we find that sea of which the spirit knows therefore put me not from thee and raise not my wrath against thee for if i used my magic to bring thee to my arms yet they are thy home and once more she came towards him now the wanderer drew an arrow from his quiver and set the notch against his breast and the keen barb towards the breast of Miriamun. Draw on, he said. Thus will I take thee to my arms again. Hearken, Miriamun the witch, Miriamun the harlot, Pharaoh's wife, and queen of Chem. To thee I swore an oath indeed, and perchance because I suffered thy guile to overcome my wisdom, because I swore upon that which circles thee about, and not by the red star which gleams upon the Helen's breast, it may be that I shall lose her whom I love. So indeed the Queen of Heaven told me, yonder in sea-girt Ithaca, though to my sorrow I forgot her words. But if I lose her, or if I win, know this, that I love her, and her only, and I hate thee like the gates of hell, for thou hast tricked me with thy magic, thou hast stolen the shape of beauty's self and dared to wear it, thou hast drawn a dreadful oath from me, and I have taken thee to wife, and more, thou art the queen of Chem, Thou art Pharaoh's wife, whom I swore to guard. But thou hast brought the last shame upon me, for now I am a man dishonored, and I have sinned against the hospitable hearth and the God of guests and hosts. And therefore I will do this. I will call together the guard of which I am chief, and tell them all thy shame, ay, and all my sorrow. I will shout it in the streets. I will publish it from the temple tops. And when Pharaoh comes again, I will call it into his ear, till he and all who live in Chem know thee for what thou art, and see thee in thy naked shame. She hearkened, and her face grew terrible to see. A moment she stood as though in thought, one hand pressed to her brow and one upon her breast. Then she spoke. Is that thy last word, wanderer? It is my last word, queen, he answered and turned to go. Then with the hand that rested on her breast she rent her night robes and tore her perfumed hair. Past him she rushed towards the door and as she ran sent scream on scream echoing up the painted walls. The curtains shook the doors were burst asunder, and through them poured guards, eunuchs, and waiting women. Help! she cried, pointing to the wanderer. Help! Help! Oh, save mine honor from this evil man, this foreign thief whom Pharaoh sent to guard me, and who guards me thus. This coward who dares to creep upon me, the queen of Chem, even as I slept in Pharaoh's bed. And she cast herself upon the floor and threw her hair about her and lay there groaning and weeping, as though in the last agony of shame. Now when the guards saw how the thing was, a great cry of rage and shame went up from them, and they rushed upon the wanderer like wolves upon a stag at bay. But he leapt backwards to the side of the bed, and even as he leapt he set the arrow in his hand upon the string of the great black bow. Then he drew it to his ear, the bowstring sang, the arrow rushed forth, and he who stood before it got his death. Again the bowstring sang, again the arrow rushed, and lo, another man was sped. A third time he drew the bow, and the soul of a third went down the ways of hell. Now they rolled back from him as the waters roll from a rock, for none dares face the shafts of death. They shot at him with spears and arrows from behind the shelter of the pillars, but none of these might harm him, for some fell from his mail, and some he caught upon his buckler. Now among those who had run thither at the sound of the cries of Miramun, 
was that same Kuri, the miserable captain of the Sidonians, whose life the wanderer had spared, and whom he had given to the queen to be her jeweller. And when Kuri saw the wanderer's plight, he thought in his greedy heart of those treasures that he had lost, and of how he, who had been a captain and a rich merchant of Sidon, was now nothing but a slave. Then a great desire came upon him to work the wanderer ill, if so he might. Now all round the edge of the chamber were shadows, for the light was yet faint, and Kuri crept into the shadows, carrying a long spear in his hand, and that spear was hafted into the bronze point which had stood in the wanderer's helm. Little did the wanderer glance his way, for he watched the lances and arrows that flew towards him from the portal. So the end of it was that the Sidonian passed round the chamber unseen, and climbed into the golden bed of Pharaoh on the further side of the bed. Now the wanderer stood with his back to the bed and a spear's length from it, and in the silken hangings were fixed spears and arrows. Kuri's first thought was to stab him in the back, but this he did not, first because he feared lest he should fail to pierce the golden harness, and the wanderer should turn and slay him, and again because he hoped that the wanderer would be put to death by torment, and he was fain to have a hand in it, for after the fashion of the Sidonians he was skilled in the tormenting of men. Therefore he waited till presently the wanderer let fall his buckler and drew the bow, but ere the arrow reached his ear, Kuri had stretched out his spear from between the hangings, and touched the string with the keen bronze, so that it burst asunder and the grey shaft fell upon the marble floor. Then, as the wanderer cast down the bow and turned with a cry to spring on him who had cut the cord, for his eye had caught the sheen of the outstretched spear, Kuri lifted the covering of the purple web which lay upon the bed, and deftly cast it over the hero's head so that he was enmeshed, thereon the soldiers and the eunuchs took heart seeing what had been done and ere ever the wanderer could clear himself from the covering and draw his sword they rushed upon him cumbered as he was they might not easily overcome him but in the end they bore him down and held him fast so that he could not stir so much as a finger then one cried aloud to miriamun the lion is trapped o queen say shall we slay him but Miriamun, who had watched the fray through the cover of her hands, shuddered and made answer, Nay, but lock his tongue with a gag, strip his armour from him, and bind him with fetters of bronze, and make him fast to the dungeon walls with great chains of bronze. There shall he bide till Pharaoh come again, for against Pharaoh's honour he hath sinned and shamefully broken that oath he swore to him, and therefore shall pharaoh make him die in such fashion as seems good to him now when kuri heard these words and saw the wanderer's sorry plight he bent over him and said it was i kuri the sidonian who cut the cord of thy great bow eperitus with the spear point that thou gavest back to me i cut it i whose folk thou didst slay and madest me a slave and I will crave this boon of Pharaoh, that mine shall be the hand to torment thee night and day, till at last thou diest, cursing the day that thou wast born. The wanderer looked upon him and answered, There thou liest, thou Sidonian dog, for this is written in thy face, that thou thyself shalt die within an hour, and that strangely. Then Curry shrank back, scowling, but no more words might Odysseus speak, for at once they forced his jaws apart and gagged him with a gag of iron, and thereafter, stripping his harness from him, they bound him with fetters as the queen had commanded. Now while they dealt thus with the wanderer, Miriamun passed into another chamber and swiftly threw robes upon her to hide her disarray, clasping them around her with the golden girdle which now she must always wear but her long hair she left unbound, nor did she wash the stain of tears from her face. 
for she was minded to seem shamed and woe-begone in the eyes of all men till pharaoh came again ray and the golden helen passed through the streets of the city till they came to the palace gates and here they must wait till the dawn for ray thinking to come thither with the wanderer who was the captain of the guard had not learned the word of entry easy would it be for me to win my way through those great gates said helen to ray at her side but it is my counsel that we wait a while perchance he whom we seek will come forth so they entered the porch of the temple of osiris that looked towards the gates and there they waited till the dawn gathered in the eastern sky the helen spoke no word but ray watching her knew that she was troubled at heart though he might not see her face because of the veil she wore for from time to time she sighed and the red star rose and fell upon her breast at length the first arrow of the dawn fell upon the temple porch and she spoke now let us enter she said my heart forebodes evil indeed but much of evil i have known and where the gods drive me there i must go they came to the gates and the man who watched them opened to the priest ray and the veiled woman who went with him though he marvelled at the beauty of the woman's shape where are thou fellow guards ray asked of the soldier i know not he answered but anon a great tumult rose in the palace and the captain of the gate went thither leaving me only to guard the gate hast thou seen the lord epiritus ray asked again nay i have not seen him since supper-time last night nor has he visited the guard as is his wont ray passed on wondering and with him went helen as they trod the palace they saw folk flying towards the hall of banquets that is near the queen's chambers some bore arms in their hands and some bore none but all fled east toward the hall of banquets whence came a sound of shouting now they drew near the hall and there at the further end where the doors are that lead to the queen's chambers a great crowd was gathered hide thee lady hide thee said ray to her who went with him for methinks that death is afoot here see here hangs a curtain stand thou behind it while i learn what this tumult means she stepped behind the curtain that hung between the pillars as ray bade her for now helen's gentle breast was full of fears and she was as one dazed even as she stepped one came flying down the hall who was of the servants of ray the priest stay thou ray cried to him and tell me what happens yonder ill deeds lord said the servant eperitus the wanderer whom pharaoh made captain of his guard when he went forth to slay the rebel apura eperitus hath laid hands on the queen whom he was sent to guard but she fled from him and her cries awoke the guard and they fell upon him in pharaoh's very chamber some he slew with shafts from the great black bow but kuri the sidonian cut the string of the bow and the wanderer was borne down by many men now they have bound him and dragged him to the dungeons there to await judgment from the lips of pharaoh see they bring him i must be gone on my errand to the keeper of the dungeons the golden helen heard the shameful tale and such sorrow shook her that had she been mortal she had surely died this then was the man whom she had chosen to love this was he whom last night she should have wed once more the gods had made a mock of her so had it ever been so it should ever be loveless had she lived all her life days now she had learned to love once and for ever and this was the fruit of it she clasped the curtain lest she should sink to the earth and hearing a sound looked forth a multitude of men came down the hall before them walked ten soldiers bearing a litter on their shoulders in the litter lay a man gagged and fettered with fetters of bronze so that he might not stir and they bore him as men bear a stag from the chase or a wild bull to the sacrifice it was the wanderer's self the wanderer overcome at last and he seemed so mighty even in his bonds and his eyes shone with so fierce a light that the crowd shrank from him as though in fear thus did helen see her love and lord again as they bore him dishonoured to his dungeon cell 
she saw, and a moan and a cry burst from her heart. A moan for her own woe, and a cry for the shame and faithlessness of him who she must love. Oh, how fallen art thou, Odysseus, who wast of men the very first, she cried. He heard it, and knew the voice of her who cried, and he gazed around. The great veins swelled upon his neck and forehead, and he struggled so fiercely that he fell from the litter to the ground. But he might not rise because of the fetters, nor speak because of the gag, so they lifted him again and bore him thence. And after him went all the multitude save Ray alone. For Ray was fallen in shame and grief because of the tale that he had heard, and of the deed of darkness that the man he loved had done. For not yet did he remember and learn to doubt. So he stood hiding his eyes in his hands, and as he stood Helen came forth and touched him on the shoulder, saying, Lead me hence, old man. Lead me back to my temple. My love is lost indeed. But there where I found it, I will abide till the gods make their will clear to me. He bowed, saying no word, and following Helen stepped into the center of the hall. There he stopped, indeed, for down it came the queen, her hair streaming, all her robes disordered, and her face stained with tears. She alone, save for Kuri the Sidonian, who followed her, and she walked wildly as one distraught who knows not where she goes nor why. Helen saw her also. "'Who is this royal lady that draws near?' she asked of Ray. "'It is Miriamun, the queen, she whom the wanderer hath brought to shame. "'Stay then, I would speak with her.' "'Nay, nay,' cried Ray, "'she loves thee not, lady, and will slay thee. "'That cannot be.' Helen answered. End of chapter one. Book three, chapter two of The World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Two, The Coming of Pharaoh. Presently, as she walked, Miriam saw Ray the priest and the veiled woman at his side, and she saw on the woman's breast a red jewel that burnt and glowed like a heart of fire. Then, like fire, burned in the heart of Miriam, for she knew that this was Argive Helen who stood before her, Helen whose shape she had stolen like a thief with the mind of a thief. Say, she cried to Ray, who bowed before her, say, who is this woman? Ray looked at the queen with terrified eyes, and spake in a voice of warning. This is that goddess who dwells in the temple of Hathor, he said. Let her pass in peace, O queen. In peace she shall pass indeed, answered Miriamun. What saidest thou, old daughter? That goddess... Nay, no goddess have we here, but an evil-working witch, who hath brought woes unnumbered upon Kem. Because of her, men die month by month, till the vaults of the temple of Hathor are full of her slain. Because of her, it was that curse upon curse fell on the land. The curse of water turned to blood, of hail and terrible darkness, ay, and the curse of the death of the firstborn among whom my own son died. And thou hast dared, Ray, to bring this witch here to my palace halls? By Amen, if I had not loved thee always, thy life should pay the price. And thou, and she stretched her hand towards the Helen, thou hast dared to come. It is well. No more shalt thou bring evil upon Kem. Hearken, slave. And she turned to Kuri the Sidonian. Draw that knife of thine, and plunge it to the hilt in the breast of yonder woman. So shalt thou win freedom, and all thy goods shall be given thee again. Then for the first time Helen spake. I charge thee, lady, she said in slow, soft tones. Bid not thy servant do this deed. For though I have little will to bring evil upon men, 
yet I may not lightly be affronted. Now Curry hung back doubtfully, fingering his dagger. Draw, knave, draw, cried Miriamun, and do my bidding, or presently thou shalt be slain with this same knife. When the Sidonian heard these words, he cried aloud with fear, for he well knew that as the queen said, so it would be done to him. Instantly he drew the great knife and rushed upon the veiled woman. But as he came, Helen lifted her veil, so that her eyes fell upon his eyes, and the brightness of their beauty was revealed to him, and when he saw her loveliness, he stopped suddenly as one who is transfixed of a spear. Then madness came upon him, and with a cry he lifted the knife, and plunging it not into her heart, but into his own, fell down dead. This, then, was the miserable end of Curry, the Sidonian, slain by the sight of the beauty. Thou seest, lady, said Helen, turning from the dead Sidonian, no man may harm me. For a moment the queen stood astonished, while Ray the priest muttered prayers to the protecting gods. Then she cried, Be gone, thou living curse, be gone! Wherefore art thou come here to work more woe in this house of woe and death? Fear not, answered the Helen. Presently I will be gone, and trouble thee no more. Thou askest why I am come hither. I came to see him who was my love, and whom but last night I should have wed, but whom the gods have brought to shame unspeakable. Odysseus of Ithaca, Odysseus, Laertes' son, for this cause I came, and I have stayed to look upon the face of her whose beauty had power to drive the thought of me from the heart of Odysseus, and bring him who of all men was the greatest hero and the foremost left alive to do a dastard deed and make his mighty name a byword and a scorn. Knowest thou, Miriamun, that I find the matter strange, since if all else be false, Yet is this true, that among women the fairest are the most strong. Thou art fair indeed, Miriamun, but judge if thou art more fair than Argive Helen. And she drew the veil from her face, so that the splendor of her beauty shone out upon the queen's dark loveliness. Thus for a while they stood facing each other, and to Ray it seemed as though the spirits of death and life looked on one another as though the darkness and the daylight stood in woman's shape before him. Thou art fair indeed, said the queen, but in this which has thy beauty failed to hold him who thou wouldst wed from the most shameless sin. Little methinks can that man have loved thee who crept upon me like a thief to snatch my honour from me. Then Helen bethought her of what Ray had said, that Miriamun loved the wanderer, and she spoke again. Now it comes into my heart, Egyptian, that true and false are mixed in this tale of thine. Hard it is to believe that Odysseus of Ithaca could work such a coward deed as this, or unbidden seek to clasp thee to his heart. Moreover, I read in thine eyes that thou thyself dost love the man whom thou namest dastard. Nay, hold thy peace, Look not so wildly on me whom thou canst not harm, but hearken. Whether thy tale be true or false, I know not, who use no magic, and learn those things only that the gods reveal to me. But this at the least is true, that Odysseus, whom I should have wed, has looked on thee with eyes of love even in that hour when I waited to be made his wife. Therefore the love that but two days agone bloomed in my heart, dies and withers. Or if it does not, at least I cast it from me and tread its flowers beneath my feet. For this doom the gods have laid upon me, who am of all women the most hapless, to live beloved but loveless through many years, and at the last to love and be betrayed. And now I go hence back to my temple shrine, but fear not, Miriamun. Not for long shall I trouble thee or Kim, and men shall die no more because of my beauty, for I shall presently pass hence whither the gods appoint. And this I say to thee, 
deal gently with that man who has betrayed my faith for whatever he did was done for the love of thee it is no mean thing to have won the heart of odysseus of ithaca out of the hand of argive helen fare thee well miriamon who wouldst have slain me may the gods grant thee better days and more joy than is given to helen who would look upon thy face no more thus she spake and letting her veil fall turned to go for a while the queen stood shamed to silence by these gentle words that fell like dew upon the fires of her hate but ere helen had passed the length of a spear her fury burned up again what should she let this strange woman go this woman who alone of all that breathed was more beautiful than she by the aid of whose stolen beauty she alone had won her love and for whose sake she had endured such bitter words of scorn nay while helen yet lived she could find not joy nor sleep but were helen dead then perchance all might yet be well and the wanderer yet be hers for when the best is gone men turn them to the better close the gates and bar them she cried to the men who now streamed back into the hall and they ran to do her bidding so that before helen reached the palace doors they had been shut and the gates of bronze beyond had clashed like the shields of men now helen drew near the doors stay yon witch cried the queen to those who guarded them and in wonder they poised their spears to bar the way to helen but she only lifted her veil and looked upon them then their arms fell from their hands and they stood amazed at the sight of beauty open i beseech you said the helen gently and straight away they opened the doors and she passed through followed by those who guarded them by the queen and by ray but one man there was who did not see her beauty and he strove in vain to hold back the doors and to clasp helen as she passed now she drew near to the gates shoot the witch cried miriam the queen if she passes the gates by my royal word i swear that ye shall die every man of you shoot her with arrows then three men drew their bows mightily the string of the bow of one burst and the bow was shattered and the arrow of the second slipped as he drew it and passing downwards pierced his foot and the shaft of the third swerved ere it struck the breast of helen and sunk into the heart of that soldier who was next to the queen so that he fell down dead it was the same man who had striven to hold to the doors and clasp the helen then helen turned and spoke bid not thy guard to shoot again miriamon lest the arrow find thy heart for know this no man may harm me and once more she lifted her veil and speaking to those at the gate said open i beseech you and let the hathor pass now their weapons fell from their hands and they looked upon her beauty and they too made haste to open the gates the great gates clanged upon their sockets and rolled back she passed through them and all who were there followed after her but when they looked lo she had mingled with the people who went to and fro and was gone then miriamon grew white with rage because helen whom she hated had escaped her and turning to those men who had opened the doors and those who had given passage of the gates who yet stood looking on each other with dazed eyes she doomed them to die but ray kneeling before her prayed for their lives ill will come of it o queen he said as ill came to yonder sidonian and to the soldiers at thy feet for none may work evil on this goddess or those who befriended the goddess slay them not o queen lest ill tidings follow on the deed then the queen turned on him madly hearken thou ray she said speak thus again and though i have loved thee and thou hast been the chief of the servants of pharaoh this i swear that thou shalt die the first already the count is long between thee and me for it was thou who didst bring yon accursed witch to my palace now thou hast heard and of this be sure as i have spoken so i will do get thee gone get thee from my sight i say lest i slay thee now i take back thy honours i strip thee of thy offices i gather thy wealth into my treasury 
go forth a beggar and let me see thy face no more then ray held his peace and fled for it were better to stand before a lioness robbed of her whelps than before miriam in her rage thereon the gates were shut again and the captain of the gates was dragged before the place where the queen stood and asking no mercy and taking little heed for still his soul was filled with the beauty of helen as a cup with wine he suffered death for his head was straight away smitten from him ray watching from afar groaned loud then turned and left the palace but the queen called to the soldiers to slay on even as she called there came a cry of woe without the palace gates men looked each on each again the cry rose and a voice without called pharaoh is come again pharaoh is come again and there rose a sound of knocking at the gates now for that while miriam thought no more of slaying men but bade them open the gates they opened and a man entered clad in raiment stained with travel his eyes were wild his hair was dishevelled and scarce could his face be known for the face of pharaoh Menephtah. it was so marred with grief and fear pharaoh looked on the queen he looked upon the dead who lay at her feet then laughed aloud what he cried more dead is there then no end to death and the number of his slain nay here he doth work but feebly perchance his arm grows weary come where are thy dead queen bring forth thy dead what hath chanced memta that thou speakest thus madly asked the queen she whom they name the hathor passed here and these and another who lies yonder do but mark her path speak ay i will speak queen i have a merry tale to tell thou sayest that the hathor hath passed here and these mark her footsteps well i can cap thy story he whom the apura named jave hath passed yonder by the sea of weeds and there lie many lie to mark his footsteps thy host where is thy host cried the queen at the least some are left yes queen all are left all all save myself alone they drift to and fro in the sea of weeds they lie by the tens of thousands on its banks the gulls tear at their eyes the lion of the desert rends their flesh they lie unburied their breath sighs in the sea gales their blood sinks into the salt sands and osiris numbers them in the hosts of hell hearken i came upon the tribes of the apura by the banks of the sea of weeds i came at eve but i might not fall upon them because of a veil of darkness that spread between my armies and the hosts of the apura all night long through the veil of darkness and through the shrieking of a great gale i heard a sound as of the passing of a mighty people the clangor of their arms the voices of captains the stamp of beasts and the grinding of wheels the morning came and lo before me the waters of the sea were built up as a wall on the right hand and the left and between the walls of water was dry land and the apura passed between the walls then i cried to my captain to arise and follow swiftly and they did my bidding but the chariot wheels drew heavily in the sand so that before all my host had entered between the waters the apura had passed the sea then of a sudden as last of all i passed down into the path of the ocean bed the great wind ceased and as it ceased lo the walls of water that were on either side of the sea path fell together with noise like the noise of thunder i turned my chariot wheels and fled back but my soldiers my chariots and my horses were swallowed once more they were seen again on the crest of the black waves like a gleam of light upon a cloud once a great cry arose to the heaven then all was done and all was still 
and of my hosts I alone was left alive of men. So Pharaoh spoke, and a great groan rose from those who hearkened. Only Miriamun spoke. So shall things go with us while that false Hathor dwells in Chem. Now as she spoke thus, again there came a sound of knocking at the gates, and a cry of, Open, a messenger, a messenger. Open, said Miriamun. Though his tidings be ill, scarce can they match these that have been told. The gates were opened, and one came through them. His eyes stared wide in fear. So dry was his throat with haste and with sand that he stood speechless before them all. Give him wine, cried Miriamun, and wine was brought. Then he drank, and he fell upon his knees before the queen, for he knew not Pharaoh. Thy tidings, she cried. Be swift with thy tidings. Let the queen pardon me, he said. Let her not be wrath. These are my tidings. A mighty host marches towards the city of On, a host gathered from all lands of the peoples of the north, from the lands of the Tulisha, of the Shakalishu, of the Liku, and of the Sherdana. They march swiftly and raven, they lay the country to waste naught is left behind them save the smoke of burning towns the flight of vultures and the corpses of men hast done said miriamun nay o queen a great fleet sails with them up the eastern mouth of the sehor and in it are twelve thousand chosen warriors of the aquisha the sons of those men who sacked troy town and now a great groan went up to heaven from the lips of those who hearkened. Only Miriamun spoke thus. And yet the Apura are gone, for whose sake, ye say, came the plagues. They are fled, but the curse remains, and so shall things ever be with us while yon false Hathor dwells in Chem. End of chapter 2《Book Three, Chapter Three of the World's Desire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Hill. The World's Desire by H. Ryder Haggard. Chapter Three The Bed of Torment. It was nightfall, and Pharaoh sat at meat and Miriamun sat by him. The heart of Pharaoh was very heavy. He thought of that great army which now washed to and fro on the waters of the Sea of Weeds, of whose number he alone had lived to tell the tale. He thought also of the host of the Apura, who made a mock of him in the desert. But most of all, he brooded on the tidings that the messenger had brought tidings of the march of the barbarians and of the fleet of the aquausha that sailed on the eastern stream of sehor all that day he had sat in his council chamber and sent forth messengers east and north and south bidding them gather the mercenaries from every town and in every city men to make war against the foe for here in his white-walled city of tanis there were left but five thousand soldiers. And now, wearied with toil and war, he sat at meat. And as he sat, bethought him of the man whom he had left to guard the queen. Where, then, is that great wanderer? He who wore the golden harness, he asked presently. I have a tale to tell thee of the man, Miriamun answered slowly. A tale which I have not told because of all the evil tidings that beat about our ears like sand in a desert wind. Tell on, said Pharaoh. Then she bent towards him, whispering in his ear. As she whispered, the face of Pharaoh grew black as the night, and ere all the tale was done, he sprang to his feet. By a man and by Ta, he cried, here at least we have a foe whom we may conquer thou and i miriamun my sister my queen are set as far each from each as the sky is set from the temple top and little of love is there between us 
yet i will wipe away this blot upon thy honour which also is a blot upon my own sleepless shall this wanderer lie to-night and sorry shall he go to-morrow but to-morrow night he shall sleep indeed thereupon he clapped his hands summoning the guard and bade them pass to the dungeon where the wanderer lay and lead him thence to the place of punishment he bade them also call the tormentors to make ready the instruments of their craft and await him in the place of punishment then he sat for a while drinking sullenly till one came to tell him that all was prepared then pharaoh rose comest thou with me he asked nay said miriamun i would not look upon the man again and this i charge thee go not down to him this night let him be found upon the bed of torment and let the tormentors give him food and wine for so shall he die more hardly then let them light the fires at his head and at his feet and leave him till the dawn alone in the place of torment so he shall die a hundred deaths ere ever his death begins as thou wilt answered pharaoh meet out thine own punishment to-morrow when i have slept i will look upon his torment and he spoke to his servants as she desired the wanderer lay on the bed of torment in the place of torment they had taken the gag from his mouth and given him food and wine as pharaoh had commanded he ate and drank and his strength came back to him then they made fast his fetters lit the braziers at his head and foot and left him with mocking words he lay upon the bed of stone and groaned in the bitterness of his heart here then was the end of his wanderings and this was the breast of the golden helen in whose arms aphrodite had sworn that he should lie oh that he were free again and stood face to face with his foes his harness on his back nay it might not be no mortal strength could burst these fetters not even the strength of odysseus laertes son where now were those gods whom he had served should he never again hear the clarion cry of Pelas? why then had he turned him from Pelas and worshipped at the shrine of the false adelian queen thus it was that she kept her oaths thus she repaid her votary so he thought in the bitterness of his heart as he lay with closed eyes upon the bed of torment whence there was no escape and groaned would aphrodite that i had never served thee even for one little hour then had my lot gone otherwise now he opened his eyes and lo a great glory rolled about the place of torment and as he wondered at the glory a voice spoke from its midst the voice of adalian aphrodite blame me not odysseus said the heavenly voice blame me not because thou art come to this pass thyself son of laertes art to blame what did i tell thee was it not that thou shouldst know the golden helen by the red star on her breast the jewel whence fall the red drops fast and by the star alone and did she not tell thee also that thou shouldst know her by the star yet when one came to thee wearing no star but girdled with a snake my words were all forgotten thy desires led thee whither thou wouldst not go thou wast blinded by desire and couldst not discern the false from the true beauty has many shapes now it is that of helen now that of miriamun each sees it as he desires it but the star is yet the star and the snake is yet the snake and he who bewildered of his lusts swears by the snake when he should have sworn by the star shall have the snake for guerdon she ceased and the wanderer spoke groaning bitterly i have sinned o queen he said is there then no forgiveness for my sin yea there is forgiveness odysseus but first there is punishment this is thy fate never now in this space of life shalt thou be the lord of the golden helen for thou hast sworn by the snake and his thou art nor mayest thou reach the star 
yet it still shines on through the mists of death it shall shine for thee and when thou wakest again behold thine eyes shall see it fitfully and now this for thy comfort here thou shalt not die nor by torment for thy death shall come to thee from the water as the dead seer foretold but ere thou diest once more thou shalt look upon the golden helen and hear her words of love and know her kiss though thine she shall not be and learn that a great host marches upon the land of chem and with its sails a fleet of thine own people the achaeans go down and meet them and take what comes where the swords shine that smote troy and this fate is laid upon thee that thou shalt do battle against thy own people even against the sons of them by whose side thou didst fight beneath the walls of ilios and in that battle thou shalt find thy death and in thy death thou wanderer thou shalt find that which all men seek the breast of the immortal helen for though here on earth she seems to live eternally it is but the shadow of her beauty that men see each as he desires it in the halls of death she dwells and in the garden of queen persephone and there she shall be won for there no more is beauty guarded of those that stand between men and joy and there no more shall the snake seem as the star and sin have power to sever those that are one now make thy heart strong odysseus and so do as thy wisdom tells thee farewell thus the goddess spoke from the cloud of glory and lo she was gone but the heart of the wanderer was filled with joy because he knew that the helen was not lost to him for ever and he no more feared the death of shame now it was midnight and pharaoh slept but miriam the queen slept not she rose from her bed she wrapped herself in a dark cloak that hid her face and taking a lamp in her hand glided through the empty halls till she came to a secret stair down which she passed there was a gate at the foot of the stair and a guard slept by it she pushed him with her foot he awoke and sprang towards her but she held a signet before his eyes an old ring of great queen Taya, whereon a hathor worshipped the sun then he bowed and opened the gate she swept on through many passages deep into the bowels of the earth till she came to the door of a little chamber where a light shone men talked in the chamber and she listened to their talk they spoke much and laughed gleefully then she entered the doorway and looked upon them there were six in number evil-eyed men of ethiopia and seated in a circle in the centre of the circle lay the waxen image of a man and they were cutting it with knives and searing it with needles of iron and pincers made red-hot and many instruments strange and dreadful to look upon for these were the tormentors and they spoke of those pains that to-morrow they should wreak upon the wanderer and practised them but miriam who loved him shivered as she looked and muttered thus beneath her breath this i promise you black ministers of death that in the same fashion ye shall die ere another night be sped then she passed into the chamber holding the signet on high and the tormentors fell upon their faces before her majesty she passed between them and as she went she stamped with her sandaled foot upon the waxen image and brake it on the further side of the chamber was another passage and this she followed till she reached a door of stone that stood ajar here she paused a while for from within the chamber there came a sound of singing and the voice was the wanderer's voice and thus he sang endure my heart not long shalt thou endure the shame the smart the good and ill are done the end is sure endure my heart there stands two vessels by the golden throne of zeus on high from these he scatters mirth and scatters moan to men that die and thou of many joys hast had thy share thy perfect part battle and love and evil things and fair endure my heart 
fight one last greatest battle under shield wage that war well then seek thy fellows in the shadowy field of asphodel there is the knightly hector there the men who fought for troy shall we not fight our battles o'er again were that not joy though no sun shines beyond the dusky west thy perfect part there shalt thou have of the unbroken rest endure my heart miriam heard and wondered at this man's hardihood and the greatness of his heart who could sing thus as he lay upon the bed of torment now she pushed the door open silently and passed in the place where she stood was dreadful it was shaped as a lofty vault and all the walls were painted with the torments of those who passed down to set after living wickedly on earth in the walls were great rings of bronze and chains and fetters of bronze wherein the bones of men yet hung in the centre of the vault there was a bed of stone on which the wanderer was fastened with fetters he was naked save only for a waistcloth and at his head and feet burned polished braziers that gave light to the vault and shone upon the instruments of torment beyond the further braziers grinned the gate of seket that is shaped like a woman and the chains wherein the victim is set for the last torment by fire were hanging from the roof miriam passed stealthily behind the head of the wanderer who might not see her because of the straightness of his bonds yet it seemed to her that he heard somewhat for he ceased from singing and turned his ear to hearken she stood a while in silence looking on him she loved who of all living men was the goodliest by far then at length he spoke craftily who art thou he said if thou art of the number of the tormentors begin thy work i fear thee not and no groan shall thy worst torture wring from these lips of mine but i tell thee this that ere i be three days dead the gods shall avenge me terribly both on thee and those who sent thee with fire and with sword they shall avenge me for a great host gathers and draws nigh a host of many nations gathered out of all lands i and a fleet manned with the sons of my own people of the archians terrible in war they rush on like ravening wolves and the land is black before them but the land shall be stamped red behind their feet soon they shall give this city to the flames the smoke of it shall go up to heaven and the fire shall be quenched at last in the blood of its children ay in thy blood thou who dost look on me hearing these words miriamun bent forward to look on the face of the speaker and to see what was written there and as she moved her cloak slipped apart showing the snake's head with the eyes of flame that was set about her as a girdle fiercely they gleamed and the semblance of them was shown faintly on the polished surface of the brazier wherein the fire burned at the wanderer's feet he saw it and now he knew who stood behind him say miriam and the queen pharaoh's dishonoured wife he said say wherefore art thou come to look upon thy work nay stand not behind me stand where i may see thee fear not i am strongly bound nor may i lift a hand against thee then miriamun still speaking no word but wondering much because he knew her ere his eyes fell upon her passed round the bed of torment and throwing down her cloak stood before him in her dark and royal loveliness he looked upon her beauty then spoke again say wherefore art thou come hither miriamun surely with my ears i heard thee swear that i had wronged thee wouldst thou then look on him who wronged thee or art thou come perchance to watch my torments while thy slaves tear limb from limb and quench yon fires with my blood o oh, thou evil woman thou hast worked woe on me indeed and perchance canst work more woe now that i lie helpless here but this i tell thee that thy torments shall outnumber mine as the stars outnumber the earth for here and hereafter 
thou shalt be parched with such a thirst of love as never may be quenched and in many another land and in many another time thou shalt endure thine agony afresh again and again thou shalt clasp and conquer again and yet again thou shalt let slip and in the moment of triumph lose by the snake's head i swore my troth to thee i who should have sworn by the star and this i tell thee miriamun that as the star shall shine and be my beacon through the ages so through the ages shall the snake encircle thee and be thy doom hold said miriamun pour no more bitter words upon me whom am distraught of love and was maddened by thy scorn wouldst thou know then why i am come hither for this cause i am come to save thee from thy doom hearken the time is short it is true though how thou knowest it i may not guess it is true that the barbarians march on Kem, and with them sails a fleet laden with the warriors of thine own people this also is true pharaoh has returned alone and all his host is swallowed in the sea of weeds and i foolish that i am i would save thee odysseus thus i will put it in the heart of pharaoh to pardon thy great offence and send thee forward against the foe yes i can do it but this thou shalt swear to me to be true to pharaoh and smite the barbarian host that i will swear said the wanderer ay and keep the oath though it is hard to do battle on my kin is that all thy message miriamun not all odysseus one more thing must thou swear or if thou swearest it not here thou shalt surely die know this she who is in chem is named the hathor but who perchance has other names hath put thee from her because last night thou wast wed to me it may well be so said the wanderer she hath put thee from her and thou thou art bound to me by that which cannot be undone and by an oath that may not be broken in whatever shape i walk or by whatever name i am known among men still thou art bound to me as i am bound to thee this then thou shalt swear that thou wilt tell not of last night's tale to pharaoh that i swear said the wanderer also that if pharaoh be gathered to osiris and it should chance that she who is named the hathor pass with him to the underworld then that thou odysseus wilt wed me miriamun and be faithful to me for thy life days now the crafty odysseus took counsel with his heart and bethought him of the words of the goddess he saw that it was in the mind of miriamun to slay pharaoh and the helen but he cared nothing for the fate of pharaoh and he knew well that helen might not be harmed and that though she change eternally wearing now this shape and now that yet she dies only when the race of men is dead then to be gathered to the number of the gods this he knew also that now he must go forth on his last wandering for death should come upon him from the water therefore he answered readily that oath i swear also miriamun and if i break it i may perish in shame and for ever now miriamun heard and knelt beside him looking upon him with eyes of love it is well odysseus perchance ere long i shall claim thy oath oh think not so ill of me if i have sinned i have sinned from love of thee long years ago odysseus thy shadow fell upon my heart and i clasped its emptiness now thou art come and i who pursued a shadow from sleep to sleep and dream to dream saw thee a living man and loved thee to my ruin then i tamed my pride and came to win thee to my heart and the gods sent another shape upon me so thou sayest and in that shape the shape of her thou seekest thou didst make me wife to thee perchance she and i are one odysseus at the least not so readily had i forsaken thee 
oh when thou didst stand in thy might holding those dogs at bay till the sidonian knave cut thy bowstring what of him tell me what of kuri this i would ask thee queen that he be laid where i lie and die the death to which i am doomed gladly would i give thee the boon she answered but thou askest too late the false hathor looked upon him and he slew himself now i will away the night wanes and pharaoh must dream dreams ere dawn fare thee well odysseus thy bed is hard to-night but soft is the couch of kings that waits thee and she went forth from him ay miriam said the wanderer looking after her hard is my bed to-night and soft is the couch of the kings of men that waits me in the realms of queen persephone but it is not thou who shalt share it hard is my bed to-night harder shall thine be through all the nights of death that are to come when the erinies work their will on folk forsworn end of chapter three book three chapter four of the world's desire this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie hill the world's desire by h rider haggard chapter four pharaoh's dream pharaoh slept heavily in his place for he was wearied with grief and toil but miriam passed into the chamber and standing at the foot of the golden bed lifted up her hands and by her art called visions down on pharaoh false dreams through the ivory gate so pharaoh dreamed and thus his vision went he dreamed that he slept in his bed and that the statue of ta the creator descended from the pedestal by the temple gate and came to him towering over him like a giant then he dreamed that he awoke and prostrating himself before the god asked the meaning of his coming thereon the god spoke to him menepta my son whom i love hearken unto me the nine bow barbarians overrun the ancient land of chem nine nations march up against chem and lay it waste hearken unto me my son and i will give thee victory awake awake from sloth and i will give thee victory thou shalt hew down the nine bow barbarians as a countryman hews a rotting palm they shall fall and thou shalt spoil them but hearken unto me my son thou shalt not thyself go up against them lo in thy dungeon there lies a mighty chief skilled in the warfare of the barbarians a wanderer who hath wandered far thou shalt release him from his bonds and set him over thy armies and of the sin that he hath sinned thou shalt take no heed awake awake menepta with this bow which i give thee shalt thou smite the nine bow barbarians then miriamun laid the bow of the wanderer even the black bow of eurytus on the bed beside pharaoh and passed thence to her own chamber and the deceitful dream too passed away early in the morning a waiting woman came to the queen saying that the pharaoh would speak with her she went into the antechamber and found him there and in his hand was the black bow of eurytus dost thou know this weapon he asked yea i know it she answered and thou shouldst know it also for surely it saved us from the fury of the people on the night of the death of the firstborn it is the bow of the wanderer who lies in the place of torment and waits his doom because of the wrong he would have wrought upon me if he hath wronged thee yet it is he who shall save chem from the barbarians said pharaoh listen now to the dream that i have dreamed and he told her all the vision it is indeed evil that he who would have wrought such wickedness upon me should go forth honoured the first host of the pharaoh quoth Merimun. yet as the god hath spoken so let it be send now and bid them loose the man from the place of torment and put his armour on him and bring him before thee so pharaoh went out and the wanderer was loosened from his bed of stone and clothed again in his golden harness and came forth glorious to see and stood before pharaoh but no arms were given him 
then the pharaoh told him all his dream and why he caused him to be released from the grip of the tormentors the wanderer hearkened in silence saying no word now choose thou wanderer said pharaoh choose if thou wilt be borne back to the bed of torment there to die beneath the hands of the tormentors or if thou wilt go forth as the captain of my host to do battle with the nine bow barbarians who waste the land of Kem. It seems there is little faith in thine oaths, therefore I ask no more oaths from thee. But this I swear, that if thou art false to my trust, I will yet find means to bring thee back to that chamber whence thou wast led but now. Then the wanderer spoke of that charge pharaoh which is laid against me i will say nothing though perchance if i stood upon my trial for the sin that is laid against me i might find words to say thou askest no oath from me and no oath i swear and yet i tell thee that if thou givest me ten thousand soldiers and a hundred chariots i will smite these foes of thine so that they shall come no more to Kem. ay though they be of my own people yet will i smite them and if i fail then may those who go with me slay me and send me down to hades thus he spoke and as he spoke he searched the hall with his eyes for he desired to see ray the priest and charge him with a message to helen but he sought him in vain for ray had fled and was in hiding from the anger of miriamun then pharaoh bade his officers take the wanderer and set him in a chariot and bear him to the city of on where pharaoh's host was gathering their charge was to watch him night and day with uplifted swords and if he so much as turned his face from the foe towards tanis then they should slay him but when the host of pharaoh marched from on to do battle on the foe then they should give the wanderer his own sword and the great black bow and obey him in everything but if he turned his back upon the foe then they should slay him or if the host of pharaoh were driven back by the foe then they should slay him the wanderer heard and smiled as a wolf smiles but spoke no word thereon the great officers of pharaoh took him and led him forth they set him in a chariot and with the chariot went a thousand horsemen and soon Miriamun, watching from the walls of Tanis, saw the long line of desert dust that marked the passing of the wanderer from the city which he should see no more. The wanderer also looked back on Tanis with a heavy heart. There, far away, he could see the shrine of Hathor gleaming like crystal above the tawny flood of waters, and he must go down to death, leaving no word for her who sat in the shrine and deemed him faithless and forsworn. Evil was the lot that the gods had laid upon him, and bitter was his guerdon. His thoughts were sad enough while the chariot rolled towards the city of On, where the host of Pharaoh was gathering, and the thunder of the feet of horses echoed in his ears, when, as he pondered, it chanced that he looked up. There, on a knoll of sand before him, a bowshot from the chariot, stood a camel and on the camel a man sat as though he waited the coming of the host idly the wanderer wondered who this might be and as he wondered the man urged the camel towards the chariot and halting before it cried hold in a loud voice who art thou cried the captain of the chariot who darest cry hold to the host of pharaoh I am one who have tidings of the barbarians, the man made answer from the camel. The wanderer looked on him. He was wondrous little, withered and old. Moreover, his skin was black as though with the heat of the sun, and his clothing was a beggar's rags, though the trappings of the camel were of purple leather and bossed with silver. Again the wanderer looked. He knew him not and yet there was that in his face which seemed familiar now the captain of the chariot bade the driver halt the horses and cried draw near and tell thy tidings to none will i tell my tidings save to him who shall lead the host of pharaoh let him come down from the chariot and speak with me that may not be said the captain for he was charged that the wanderer should have speech with none 
as thou wilt answered the aged man upon the camel go then go to thy doom thou art not the first who hath turned aside a messenger from the gods i am minded to bid the soldiers shoot thee with arrows cried the captain in anger so shall my wisdom sink in the sand with my blood and be lost with my breath shoot on thou fool now the captain was perplexed for from the aspect of the man he deemed that he was sent by the gods he looked at the wanderer who took but little heed or so it seemed but in his crafty heart he knew that this was the best way to win speech with the man upon the camel then the captain took counsel with the captain of the horsemen and in the end they said to the wanderer descend from the chariot lord and walk twelve paces forward and there hold speech with the man but if thou go one pace further then we will shoot thee and the man with arrows and this he cried out also to him who sat upon the camel then the man on the camel descended and walked twelve paces forward and the wanderer descended also from the chariot and walked twelve paces forward but as one who heeds little what he does now the two stood face to face but out of earshot of the host who watched them with arrows set upon the strings greetings odysseus of ithaca son of laertes he said who was clothed in the beggar's weeds the wanderer looked upon him hard and knew him through his disguise greeting ray the priest commander of the legion of amen chief of the treasury of amen ray the priest i am indeed he answered the rest i am no more for miriamun the queen has stripped me of my wealth and offices because of thee thou wanderer and the immortal whose love thou hast won and by whom thou hast dealt so ill hearken i learn by arts known to me of the dream of pharaoh and of thy sending forth to do battle with the barbarians then i disguised myself as thou seest and took the swiftest camel in tanis and i am come hither by another way to meet thee now i would ask thee one thing how came it that thou didst play the immortal false that night knowest thou that she waited for thee there by the pylon gate ay there i found her and led her to the palace and for that i am stripped of my rank and goods by miriamun and now the lady of beauty is returned to her shrine grieving bitterly for thy faithlessness though how she passed thither i know not methought i heard her voice as those knaves bore me to my dungeon said the wanderer and she deemed me faithless say ray dost thou know the magic of miriamun dost thou know how she won me to herself in the shape of argive helen and then in as few words as might be he told ray how he had been led away by the magic of miriamun how he who should have sworn by the star had sworn by the snake when ray heard that the wanderer had sworn by the snake he shuddered now i know all he said fear not thou wanderer not on thee shall all the evil fall nor on that immortal whom thou dost love the snake that beguiled thee shall avenge thee also ray the wanderer said one thing i charge thee i know that i go down to my death therefore i pray thee seek out her whom thou namest the hathor and tell her all the tale of how i was betrayed so shall i die happily tell her also that i crave her forgiveness and that i love her and her only this i will do if i may ray answered and now the soldiers murmur and i must be gone listen the might of the nine bow barbarians rolls up the eastern branch of sehor but one day's march from the on the mountains run down to the edge of the river and those mountains are pierced by a rocky pass through which the foe will surely come set thou thy ambush there wanderer there at prosopis so shalt thou smite them farewell I will seek out the Hathor, if in any way I can come at her, and tell her all. But of this I warn thee. The hour is big with fate, and soon will spawn a monstrous birth. Strange visions of doom and death pass before mine eyes as I slept last night. Farewell. 
Then he went back to the camel and climbed it, and passing round the army vanished swiftly in a cloud of dust. The wanderer also went back to the host, where the captains murmured because of the halt, and mounted his chariot, but he would tell nothing of what the man had said to him, save that he was surely a messenger from the underworld to instruct him in the waging of war. Then the chariot and the horsemen passed on again, till they came to the city of On, and found the host of Pharaoh gathering in the great walled space that is before the temple of Ra. And there they pitched their camp hard by the great obelisks that stand at the inner gate, which Ray the architect fashioned by Thebes, and the divine Ramses Miamun set up to the glory of Ra for ever. End of chapter 4